Woo! We found something cool. Over the past month, I've just come to learn that there is so much more history here than any of the history books ever touched on. We think the water would be right here. I purchased a rock blaster to get any potential collapse out of my way. Owens Lake is coming back. This might be the longest single piece of steel that's ever been brought up this road. You never step in the same wash twice. Something is going on in that area directly next to the writer's cabin. We've located the burial sites of six people. All right, welcome to Cerro Gordo. It has been three years and three months that I have been calling this former mining town home. There is no way that I could have known back in March of 2020 when I tried to get up to town in my tiny two-wheel drive Tacoma that I would end up walking into the adventure of a lifetime. And it takes months like this past month or so to remind me that there is no telling what's ahead of me here at Cerro Gordo. And there's really no telling all the stories that are to find from the past too. I mean, this town used to have 4,000 residents in it. There used to be the largest silver mine in California up here. You know, that's thousands of stories to tell. You know, we've had historians over the past month or so that have just blown my mind with the people and events that have happened here that have never been told before. You know, we've had a project that I've been working on for three years finally seem to get in the stride with the hotel. And all of that just has made me realize once again that this place is magic, that there's so much more to tell here. There's so much more to do here. There's so much more life to be had here. And that's all left me very excited. So with that, let's get into whatever's been going on the last month or so up here at Cerro Gordo. And now an update that I am always very excited to give. Right now, I am sitting in what will become a window here at the American Hotel. And there has been a lot of progress since the last update. It's actually looking like a building these days. I can sit in a window. I could look out that window at a surprisingly full Owens Lake. And it's all very exciting. You know, we lost the original American Hotel just over three years ago, and it has just been a battle since. You know, there's almost an incalculable amount of time spent just getting the materials up here. Not to mention the architecture, the engineering, the contractors and all of that. And that's because we're at the top of a mountain. In many ways, it's been the hardest project of my life, but in many ways, it's been the most rewarding as well. You know, there's been times where I thought we'd never get to this stage. I'd never be able to look around and look at the first floor and what is gonna become the second floor. You know, it truly took an army to get here. You know, so many people, whether that was helping with transportation up here, the material on the ground, even just any of the support system there within, whether that's, you know, water to, to get the crew going. It has just been an amazing experience. You know, I think each time one of these frustrations comes up, one of these stressors, and each time we get past it, it just makes me more and more confident that we're gonna get past all the obstacles that go into building this thing. All right, good morning. As you can see, I am walking on the floor of what will be the first floor of the American Hotel. Today is a very big day though. Today, the walls start going up. The issue is the wood for the walls is way down there in Keeler. So, I am going to jump into the five ton truck and I'm gonna head down to Keeler, get the wood, bring it back up here, and uh, we're gonna start framing out these walls. All right, so we're all loaded up. We got 16 foot two by sixes, 16 foot two by fours. I look like a crazy person with these goggles on, but we are headed back up the hill. Framer should be up there. We just gotta get this wood up there so we can start framing in the walls. Let's go! All right, so we're finally ready to start framing. Uh, the boys are hauling up all our studs right now. Manual labor until we get our forklift back up here. And then we're just gonna start standing walls. Framing walls and standing walls. These days, I feel like it's in really good hands. Kyle and his crew have been up here framing up the walls, sheeting the walls, even putting up these beams that I'll talk about in a minute. And it finally starts to look like a building.
after Kyle got up these walls of the first floor, then came a very interesting part of it. Then came the transportation of five 26 foot long steel I-beams with crazy tie-ins attached to them. This is something that our engineer based in LA came up with. I think it's due to snow load or just trying to create a cerebral bomb shelter. I don't know, but there was five 26 foot long steel I-beams that weighed about 2,000 pounds a piece that made their way to Keeler. All right, today's battle is getting these 26 foot long beams that are gonna support the second floor all the way up to Cerro Gordo. The problem is our bed of our five ton is only about 14 feet. So you gotta think we would have 12 feet of overhang and each foot of the steel weighs a couple hundred pounds, which let us lead to all sorts of brainstorming. Maybe we're gonna put them over the cab, over the driver's head, which seemed like a certain way to decapitate people. Well, as usual, the five ton is not working. And so we are going to attempt to put these beams on this vehicle mover. And they're gonna be hanging out the back, but we'll get some pallets in the back to give us some clearance. And then hope that my truck can maybe pull this thing up there. Never dull moment. This is where we ended up, trying to take things up. And we're gonna give it a go. All these beams again to get up there. This is what we got. Surprisingly, the transportation of the beams went a lot smoother than I could have imagined. You know, I just remember the whole time up thinking this might be the longest single piece of steel that's ever been brought up this road. We're just uh, gonna attempt to send these steel beams up there and hope for the best, just to play it by ear. After getting the first two up here, we loaded them on the crane, put them in place, and that was a very exciting day. You know, I really, really, really need to get this place enclosed by the winter so we can continue doing the work um, on the electrical and the plumbing and all that type of stuff. And I think we're in a good place. You know, it's so exciting for me to be able to watch from the Gordon house above it and see one corner of this that was just a platform before suddenly turn into a corner of a building. It's just, Finally feeling like this project's in full stride and that's in good hands. That's very exciting for everybody involved. You know, it truly took an army to get here, but I just can't wait for everybody, whether that's you just watching or anybody that's brought up materials or hammered in a nail to come sit on this deck out here and say, hey, I played a part in building that hotel. Right now, I am sitting at the cemetery here at Cerro Gordo. Back in 1800, Cerro Gordo was a silver boom town fueled by booze and greed. The newspapers back then reported a murder a week, but still nobody knows exactly how many miners are buried in this hill behind me. That's because back then, the headstones were made out of wood, and these headstones have been lost to age, they've been lost to weather, they've been lost to theft. I've heard estimates anywhere from 50 to 500 miners are buried in this cemetery. And it's always been a missing puzzle piece in the history here. But tomorrow, we might figure it out. That's because tomorrow, my friend Paul is bringing up his human remains detection dog, Bosco, and we're gonna try to determine exactly how many people are in the cemetery and exactly where the borders are. My name's Paul Dosti. I retired from the Mammoth Lakes Police Department as a detective sergeant in 2009. Paul is just an expert when it comes to human remains dogs. You know, his last dog, Buster, before Bosco, Buster was just a star. You know, he lost one of his legs to cancer. So it was a three-legged dog that found literally hundreds of human remains, including some very high profile soldiers and murder cases back in the day. You know, unfortunately, Buster passed away, but Bosco is Paul's new dog and Bosco is just a star in his own right. We have a um... A pet cemetery. It's a. It's out in the brush, but you know there's hundreds of pets, mm -hmm. dogs, cats, and so I'll take one small tube of human dirt from a, a grave, and then I'll hide it. And he has to go over all those graves, wow. and goes over like they weren't even there. He's only looking for what he's been trained for: human decomposition and human blood. That's all he knows. The thing about human remains is obviously the longer they've been in the ground, the more they decay. So you have to imagine the majority of the miners that are up in the cemetery here have been decaying for 150 years. Dogs can detect these human remains that are decomposing like one part per trillions that Paul was describing to me. I trained him uh, like a bomb dog. He finds the target odor and then he just lays down and waits for his toy. So right. you have to be very animated when you're working with these guys. Yeah. Because 
Um, they're really happy creatures, right? But they want to play. And so this, you know, human decomposition to them is like, if I find some of that, I'm getting a toy. As far as okay. the cemetery goes, uh, we'll just get up there and see what we can get. And okay. you know, I mean, you could probably run the dog here. You might alert because it's draining it's down. Draining all the way down, right? It's, it's draining all down. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> you know, our main target today was three. First was to go up to the cemetery. Next, I wanted to go back into Newtown and potentially see if there was a separate cemetery for some of the Chinese miners here. And third, we just kind of wanted to look around, see what else was out there. And so the idea that we could individually sort the grave sites didn't quite happen today. You know, there's so many people up there that kind of just the whole hillside was triggering for Bosco, meaning that there's, over the years, they're decomposing, the rain's coming, they're washing down the slope. It's kind of just spreading out the human remains all throughout that hillside. And so we'll probably make four or five runs going straight down, maybe, you know, five, 10 meters apart. And then we'll know where the boundary, at least the top boundary is of the cemetery. From there, we kind of just decided that our main goal of the cemetery was going to be defining kind of the outer borders of it. You know, when Bosco stopped signaling, meaning there was a dead area, we know that was kind of the borderline of it. And I think that in the future, there's more technology like ground penetrating radar that we can do to get exact locations of graves in a mass grave like that. But we were able to kind of loosely define the perimeter of what the cemetery would be. Okay, so it's draining down this thing too. Right. So I'm kind of thinking that there's something up there in those trees. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You got an overtime or what? <laughs> you know, just above the 1870 head marker, it seems about 10 feet above that, the cemetery pretty much stops, or at least the hits for Bosco are stopping. So we can assume that above that, not too many people are buried. You know, to the left, if you're looking at the cemetery, there's a pinion tree that seemingly marks kind of the left border. And to the right, they trenched in a power line, you know, not too long ago. And it seems like that's kind of the right border of the cemetery area. So this is what we call the decompositional plume. Okay. Okay. That's what we call this. It's, yeah. Which is decompositional event, and it's rolling downhill. You know, right. when it when it rains or something, it pushes yeah. it down here, and then that's why he just boom right there. Yeah. I think it was somewhere in here. Right. As we walked up the road further, Bosco triggered on this wash. And this wash was probably about 50 yards of void in between the other cemetery. And so that would mean potentially a few things. You know, one, above there, there might be another burial site. Or two, originally Paul thought that it was potentially a second graveyard. You know, back in the day with these mining camps, a lot of times they wouldn't want the less proper citizens of that town to be buried with everybody else. So prostitutes, gamblers, thieves, sometimes different ethnicities would have to be buried outside of the main cemetery. So Paul potentially thought that maybe there was two cemeteries right next to each other, or just outside the main cemetery gate, they would bury everybody else. And you know, after we explore the cemetery, the main cemetery here, I have a few other places I'd like to go with Paul. First, I'd like to go to Newtown. And Newtown is just on the backside of the property over the saddle, and Newtown is also known as Chinatown. And from my understanding, back in the 1800s, in similar mining camps, the Chinese workers wouldn't have the same burial grounds as the rest of the miners. Which leads me to believe that if that was the case, there's potentially a second cemetery on the backside of Cerro Gordo. And this is not reported in any of the history books. This has not been reported to me by any of the people that worked here or any of the journals or other research that I've done. But if that theory is true, that again would just add to the history here that was never known before. And so Bosco, Paul, and I just walked around for a while, you know, searching out, seeing if anything triggered. And there was three places. And the first of which is very interesting. The first place that Bosco triggered was immediately next to the, what I call the writer's cabin. So next to this cabin on the backside, the final standing wooden cabin, which is next to a mine, directly next to the building, Bosco triggered almost immediately on a very strong scent of human remains. And when we were there, Paul did something really interesting that I thought was just very illuminating on how sensitive these dogs are. You know, Bosco wasn't signaling anywhere else around this cabin, but in that one area, Paul got a rock, really put in the dirt. You know, that's where the human remains would be. That's what they're picking up on. Took that rock with the dirt elsewhere when Bosco was looking somewhere else and had Bosco go and try to signal once again. 
and immediately when they got to the rock, signaled. Wow. Good <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Wow. So yeah, that's a it's a good training aid. You know, if you have a place where there's you know you know someone's deceased or something. Right. And, and uh, he's been there for decades. The rocks are going to be boom for the dog really easily. Right. Let's see if we. Can. Okay. Okay. Let's go all the way up. I'll take you up there. See if you get him. Yeah, because it drains down, it's going to pull right here, right yeah, by the leg. Right. Something is going on in that area directly next to the writer's cabin, which is interesting to me. You know, that was a mine at one point. There was maybe somebody living there at one point. Maybe that's a check-in thing. And I wonder if potentially, if accidents happened inside the mine, if back there, they wouldn't even go through the effort of bringing them to the other side of the mine. They would just bury them near the entrance. And something that we found a little bit later on would point to that as well. But as we were wandering around, the second place that we came to is there was a flat spot next to the road that when Paul looked at it, he said, that just doesn't look like it should be flat in the way that it was. And so we went over there with Bosco and on the course of potentially a 30 foot flat spot, he signaled three times to indicate that there's three separate burials all along whether there's now a road. You know, as you guys may have known, on the backside of the property, there's a famous mine called the Lower Newtown Mine. And right by the mine itself, no triggers, you know, nothing. Bosco wasn't going crazy, but kind of off to the side of the mine, down in a flat area next to two very conspicuous pinion pines, Bosco triggered directly in between those two pines. And so an idea that I come to after finding two burial sites next to the two mines on the back side is that on the back side, you know, maybe in its heyday when the people were to die inside of those mines in a mining accident, whether it was like a fall, a dynamite, a collapse, or this and that, they would just bury them pretty much on the closest flat spot that they had. After that sixth find, you know, three in the one place, two by the upper Newtown mine, one by the lower Newtown mine, we decided to call it. You know, it's getting quite warm out. Bosco doesn't need to be outside for that that long. Uh, we have three locations, and it's in an area believed to be where Chinese workers worked. You know, there's three at one site, there's two at another site. So I think from looking at, you know, we're seeing and, you know, and looking at some of the really old stuff around that uh, we've located uh, the burial sites of six Chinese people. And this is kind of like going to be an ongoing thread as we explore all the different technologies available. I think ground penetrating radar is going to be next to where we can actually identify the exact number and potentially position even of some of these graves, we can mark them off. But it makes me think, if they were just burying people here and there, then they could potentially be burying people everywhere throughout these hills, you know? And it kind of changes my mentality that people were just getting buried in a singular cemetery or potentially two cemeteries. You know, there's been times in the past when after a big wash, there'll be a bone in the wash. And I always assume that it's just an animal bone because again, I would assume that it's not by the cemetery, but after seeing this, I don't know. Tonight, I'm gonna to go above that cemetery, see if there's anything up there, see if there's any more indication of burial sites. But as far as history goes, I think this is a great first step. I think this is obviously a morbid and kind of sensitive topic to kind of dive into as far as the history of Saragoro goes, but I think it's an important one. And I think it's one that we're just gonna continue growing over the next few months. That's gonna be um, informative one way or the other. All right, so we're back and right here behind me is where Bosco was tracking earlier for human remains. Now, above that, if you look up, there is a wash and we think maybe there's another burial site or at least another grave or buried person up somewhere in those trees. Way up on that hillside, appears to be a mine. All right, we have maybe a context clue along my road. Look down, see charcoal, charcoal, see? Anybody can find that rock. Yeah, if you dig down, more charcoal. So they're doing something around here. Well, well, well. We did not find grave, at least that I know of. We did find this tailings pile. Holy cow. Ooh. 
Uh. Whoa. Holy sh**. That is so sick. Oh man. I do not have my uh, climbing gear with me. Whoa. It's still going. This is insane. Whoa! We found something cool. The history just keeps continuing here at Cerro Gordo. You know, it just keeps getting better. And I cannot wait to go down that hole tomorrow. Assuming this rain doesn't wash us all out. Let us go. All right, we're back the next day. Phil's here. Good to go. Woo! There's one level there. I'm gonna wait to go to that on the way back up. For now, we're gonna keep going down. See what's down there. All right, we got to the bottom of that first chute and it's very narrow here because all of the debris over time, the rock, everything else has fallen in and made it not much taller than my head. A lot of rock here. I hope that these levels go a long ways in both directions. But let's check it out. Well, it looks like at least for this bottom part, this might be the end of the line. I wonder back in the day if that other side went further, but there's the one level above us, but getting to that level is gonna be tough. We're gonna have to kind of do some acrobatic swinging to get over to that level. So we're gonna go back up the ropeways, see where that leads to, keep trekking. Either way, crazy. All right, with the assist of that wood, we made it up to this first level. It doesn't appear to go too, too far back, but we're gonna go find out. But shout out that wood. Getting off of here is gonna be pretty interesting. Hey, I remember. This is probably not a huge operation. This is probably done with hand steel, meaning like, you know, you hit a rod, twist it, hit a rod, twist it. And you're maybe making, I don't know, a couple inches of progress a day. So this tower we're looking at, let's say it's 40 feet long, might represent like a year. And I always wonder like that mentality of a miner, when to kind of call it a day. And I wonder if like they heard of other guys striking it big and thinking just, hey, if I just go two more feet, maybe I hit that vein, you know? And again, this whole adventure started with trying to find a, a graveyard and we found another mine, which I didn't even know existed. And now I can know what was here, try to theorize maybe what was here, what the motivations were, but uh, I love it. You know, no matter what, these always just feel like a win to me. Hello. Welcome back. Yep. Not the one. Did you get to the bottom? I did, yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. It was something. So that was a very fun exploration for me. Um, I always love going into old mines. They're probably my favorite thing to do. You know, I just hate how everything is so programmed hour by hour 
and just like to get under a rope and go into an old mine and literally not know how deep that goes or where it goes to is just amazing. <laughs> So probably the biggest and most exciting thing over the past month has been history, and more specifically, the history yet to be told. Over the past month, I've just come to learn that there is so much more history here than any of the history books I've ever touched on, and it's just lit me up. You know, in addition to Paul and Bosco who came up, a guy named Robert Sloan also came up this month. And Robert is a cybersecurity analyst. He has a background in, uh, computer engineering, and for the past few years, Robert has just been making databases of every mention of a person, every mention of a building, every mention of everything related to Cerro Gordo. You know, we'd sit over in the Gordon and Robert would show us his presentations of what he's discovered over the past few years. You know, and as we swap this information, we learn more, it's just like every corner of Cerro Gordo beckons you to come out and learn more. You know, now that piece of dirt that I've walked past a hundred times that I've forgotten about that's full of sage grass isn't just that. Now it's the 50 by 100 home site of Jacob Jacobson who lived here in 1871. You know, with that piece of information, you can figure out who lived next to him. You know, what about the schoolhouse they talk about just to the north of him? What about this barber shop over here? You know, every little part of this town is telling a story. If you take your time and you use the right resources, be able to figure that out. I think we've been doing that this month more than any other. And it's got me almost every night over the past few weeks getting out there, hiking, repelling, searching, hunting, looking for these things. And it's just brought me so much joy. You know, and I think what we're going after isn't just past history. You know, it's not just to fill in a history book. It's about the future of Cerro Gordo too. You know, one of the main things we've been looking for is former well sites. You know, you know that back in the day, they're using so much water here and they had springs and I'm roughly familiar with some of these springs and where they were. But there's a lot of literature, handwritten letters, you know, prospectuses that talk about wells here at Cerro Gordo proper. And these wells are producing between a thousand and 10,000 gallons per day. You know, and when they were mining up here, they needed 30 or 40,000 gallons. So that might seem like enough, but how we're using it, 10,000 gallons a day would be enough to, put every building existing with running water, probably every building we could build up here with running water. We could have, you know, landscaping, we could have agriculture. It would just fundamentally change the course of this town forever and pave a path to its future. Hey, I'm Robert Sloan here in the beautiful town of Cerro Gordo, uh, up here trying to um, uncover some, some lost history. Uh, and today we're going to take a walk down toward lower Cerro Gordo looking for the first well here, which was known as Baudry's Well. It was said to uh, produce a thousand gallons of water a day. And uh, is that a, a very important point in the town where there could be a lot more water? So Brent and I are gonna head down there today. We're gonna see if we can locate this thing and uh, maybe bring some water to Cerro Gordo. And so Robert came prepared with these letters that talked about these wells. He had a prospectus that showed where these wells were. Stephen, who's a town manager up here, has a background in geology. And so kind of together, we just poured over these maps and almost every night and during the day, Robert and I took dozens of trips out, trying to slowly zero in and triangulate on where this water was. Britt and I have been down here in the wash on the way from the upper town of Cerro Gordo to the lower town of Cerro Gordo looking for water at a place known as the, uh, the Beaudry Well. Uh, we came across this lovely flat spot in the wash there's uh, plenty of green grass, which is uncommon for the area. Uh, and we're gonna concentrate our efforts here to see if we can find some uh, subterranean proof of uh, fill of maybe a hundred foot well shaft. This is the grass. And as I was saying to Robert, I will hike around a lot and I don't really see grass like that. And again, I know it's been a record snow year, but like this pocket here just seems full of this longer grass and vegetation. And there's cribbing here. I don't wanna say exactly where we think it is, but I think we're getting very close and it just gets me stoked on the future of Cerro Gordo and what we can do with that much water. And I just think that it'll just immediately change everything about this place that's so exciting. For me, where discovering stuff always leads me is to the mines. And I've read in different reports that there's levels below the 900 foot. 
They tried to drive it deeper. I had heard of maybe one, two levels. But after discussions with Robert, reviews of different documents, it seems that there's potentially four levels below the 900 foot level. And I think this past month, given how much new history we're uncovering, that has led me to get some tools, get some things needed for a very serious exploration of the 900 foot level. An exploration with the sole intent of getting down to these lower levels. You know, I've got the rope. I have 950 feet of rope. I purchased a rock blaster to get any potential collapse out of my way. Three, two, one. Whoa! That's awesome. But my next exploration in the Union Mine, which will be the next video that's coming out on this channel, is going to be crazy. It is going to be my biggest adventure yet into the Union Mine. I'm going to spend the most time down there. I'm going to have the most tools, the most resources, and more importantly, the most information to know exactly where I need to go or exactly where I need to clear to get into these levels and again, just paint an even clearer picture of Cerro Gordo. So stay tuned, that is coming. You know, all together collaboratively, everybody that watches this, you know, the reason that we're able to have this clear picture is just by the number of people that watch this channel. And it's beautiful. And it's just got me so fired up this past month or so. One thing that is always fun up here is just the animals. You know, no matter what's going on in your day, they're eating the tripod right now. And so it's just kind of one of the best things that's happened. <laughs> Hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Ah, as I was saying, we're gonna go to handheld. They all just seem to get along great these days. If you're having a bad day, coming up and hanging out with the animals is never a bad thing to do. This is Beretta, and Beretta is the one that just tipped over my tripod. She seems to want to eat it. That's Meatball up there. We got Linguini back here, who's nice. We have Spot, due to Spot's one Hi, hello Spot, how are you? Our chickens. You guys lay any eggs today? Finally, a useful animal up here at Cerro Gordo. Come on out. You wanna check it out? Come on out, everyone. Enjoy. No, but that's what we have to avoid is the goats eating the chicken feed. Sorry. We do a little swap some come, some go. Hello there. How are you? <laughs> and this lovely young lady is radio and radio has been living inside my house for the past six months or so she got upgraded from the indoor outdoors she was like no i'm an indoor only lady so radio lives in here and just lives a great life she gets all the toys she gets all the pets she gets all the hangout that is who i call their mayor the mayor's always hanging out in the sun, getting some sun. His friends are over here in the uh, tree. But these days, they like to hang out outside a lot more. So they'll go in through there. They'll jump through the screen, as you're about to see this guy do. And they'll go outside to live a wild life out with all the wildlife. They do a great job of keeping all the mice population down. And so uh, on the animal front, Happy as always. All right, another big thing this month is behind me. Owens Lake is coming back. So this is a lake that used to be 110 square miles, two times the size of Manhattan, and it was drained in 1913 as part of the LA Aqueduct Program. And now, because of the historic snowfall in the Sierras and the snowmelt coming off of that, the water is being redirected back into the lake for the first time in a very long time. It is as full as it has been in probably close to a hundred years. You know, this lake behind me used to be a huge part of Cerro Gordo. There was a port town called Swansea where the Bessie Brady began. And the Bessie Brady would transport bars of ore across the lake to what's now known as Cartago. It was transporting so many bars that hundreds of thousands of them stacked up on the other side of the lake causing the miners to create their houses out of these silver and lead bars. Then Keeler was established a few years later uh, when Julius Keeler came to town and they started putting more materials across this lake. This lake was a big active transport hub with port cities all along it. But then after that aqueduct program, it just became a dust bowl. But it's coming back and that's got me thinking and that's got me dreaming. And so what I wanna do is I wanna get in a boat, go down this, as maybe, you know, the Bessie Brady would have 
oh, 130 years ago, and just get a feel and a little transport back in time and just think of how Mother Nature always seems to win out. So we're gonna get in here, we're gonna look around and dream of the potential of a lake coming back and the potential of a city coming back. You know, for the past few months, I've watched as water just reclaims Owens Lake. The dust is being overtaken. You know, the lake's borders are creeping outwards. That reflection it throws off the Sierra every morning grows bigger every day. You know, I watch all this from a town that in its heyday saw the lake full every day. The lake was full and Cerro Gordo was a boom town. But a century later, many thought both were just a thing of the past. Chapters closed, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But gliding on the lake over the packed down dust, birds are coming back, grass is regrowing, water is carving out more of the crusty lake bed. And I can only think about change, of regeneration, of how nothing is set in stone. Owens Lake has been a dust bowl for a hundred years. Cerro Gordo hasn't had a heartbeat in just about as long, you know, but the water's coming back and the town above it is too. And there's a coincidence there, but there's also a lesson to throw out these foregone conclusions, to embrace the change, to push for that change. And gliding across the water, thinking of all that, just fills me with hope. Hope not just for the lake, not just for Cerro Gordo, but for all of us, for the dreamer whose dream hasn't come true yet, to keep on dreaming that sometimes it just takes a little bit more time, a little bit more effort, to not write it off, that nothing is set in stone. The desert became a lake, even after man spent billions trying to keep it dry. A ghost town is living once again, even after countless setbacks. And thinking of that as just a joyful feeling, one of hope, one of change, and seeing the water flow back into Owens Lake has really just filled me up with that hope, with that excitement, for whatever might happen next.